The second scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, beginning in verse 28, and then I'm going to read 28 to 34, and then 38 to 44, so I'm going to skip a few verses in there. So listen now to this reading from the Gospel, and listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you today through these words. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. <coughs> then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have no children this morning, and so we're going to just go on with the anthem. Thank you. 
I kept, kept coming back to mind this week the story that I heard a few weeks ago about Ruth Gottesman. I don't know if you guys heard about this. She was a longtime professor of pediatrics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, she is a widow, but not like the widow from the story in Mark. She's doing fine. She recently gave a gift to her school of $1 billion. <laughs> Um, what struck me about the story was I, I read about how the decision came about of what to do with that one billion dollars. Dr. Gottesman went to see the president of the college, Dr. Philip Ozua, who she had become friends with over a long period of time, to tell him she would be making a major gift. And she said, if someone said, I'll give you a transformative gift for the medical school, what would you do? And Dr. Ozua said, well, there would probably be the three things. He said, one, you could have education be free. And she said, stop right there. That's what I want to do. So now all of the students who go to Albert Einstein College of Medicine will pay no tuition. Right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, she could have asked for a lot of recognition here. Um, Dr. Ozua told her that the, the going price for getting your name on a medical school or a hospital was maybe a fifth of what she had given. So it could easily have been renamed the Dr. Gottesman School of Medicine. But she said she liked the name Albert Einstein. He was good. She said, we've got a great name. We don't need to rename it. Also recently, I heard a story about the family of a friend of a friend who donated $20 million to a local nursing school here in Houston to be used however the school needed it, and there will be scholarships from that, there'll be professorships and research and more. And they accepted the offer to name the school after them. This will be the Gessner School of Nursing at University of Houston now. The family also confided that because of taxes, this actually worked out well for them to give, I don't know how this, this kind of wealth is, is inconceivable to most of us, but somehow it was a tax advantage for them to give away $20 million. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. There's all kinds of giving. Giving can set people apart, or giving can draw people together, remind us of our need for each other and for God. In the second half of the reading today, we hear Jesus say, beware the scribes. The scribes were legal experts. So beware the legal experts who walk around in their imported suits and their shiny shoes and insist that you call them by their full honorific title and proper name. They expect you to give them the best seats at the dinners and serve them first and defer to their opinions. Meanwhile, they're reciting long, flowery prayers as if they really believe what they're saying, when at the same time, they're completely destroying the lives of the people that they're supposed to be caring for, those who are the most vulnerable. You know who these people are, the ones who might not tell you directly that their opinion matters more, but if you dare to disagree, you're gonna suffer the consequences. They're the school bullies, the people born with the right pedigree who seem to get away with everything they do, the ones who never learned the most valuable lesson that not one of us is any more valued by God than any other of us. What these legal experts have forgotten is that the law that they say they love 
doesn't just say you have to be fair. It says you have to do what's right. Sometimes fair or legal isn't enough. Sometimes, even when someone signs a contract saying that they'll give you their money in a transaction, you know that following through with that transaction will leave them destitute. You can't take their money. That's the essence of the law. That's what it's really about. And Jesus is reinforcing that here. You have to go beyond what the letter of the law says if you really want to follow God. Especially when you're up there saying long prayers. You can't act like you can approach God with a righteous heart when you're using loopholes and tax write-offs to avoid your obligation to caring for your fellow citizen. So then Jesus shows us an example, the widow who gives all she has. Lots of people are walking by that offering plate in the back of the sanctuary, putting money in, giving out of their wealth. But this woman gives what she can't give. I'd even say she gives what she shouldn't give. Take that money back, I would say. <laughs> you need that. You need to go buy supper for yourself. You can't afford to put that in there. It's a categorically different type of giving than giving $20 million to a medical school or a billion dollars to a medical school. This is giving like Jesus told that rich young man back in chapter 10. Do you remember that? The young man said that he had kept all the laws since he was a little kid. And Jesus said, great, you lack one thing. Give away everything you have to the poor. And then you'll be a part of the kingdom of God. And he went away sad because he couldn't do it. This is that kind of giving. This is the giving away of everything, the uncomfortable giving, the nonsensical giving. You don't get your name on a building for this kind of giving, but that's not why you would do it anyway. All of which brings us to the first part of the reading. We're going backwards this week. In this first section, beginning in verse 28, we meet another scribe asking Jesus yet another question. But it's a fundamentally different kind of interaction. In this reading, the scribe is almost friendly. He happened by and he overheard Jesus and some of the other scribes, legal experts, discussing things. And he's intrigued. He likes what he hears. So he decides to ask a question that you could say is maybe the question, the big question, which law is first, which law is the greatest? I've told the Jewish story before of the young man who decided he wanted to learn Torah, he wanted to learn the law, so he first went to Rabbi Shammai and he knocked on the door and he said, teach me the law in the time that I can stand on one foot. And Rabbi Shammai was insulted, of course, because the law is huge and complicated and can't be boiled down like that. So he whacked the kid across the face and said, go away. So the young man went to Rabbi Hillel and said, teach me the Torah in the time that I can stand on one foot. And Hillel said, love your fellow human being as yourself and go and study. Go and learn it. So I wonder if this scribe's question is kind of like that. Tell me the whole law really quick. What law is first? What's it all about? Summarize the wisdom of all our people for all millennia in one answer. This is a challenge to Jesus, but when Jesus answers, the scribe is satisfied. Rabbi Amy Robertson says that these two things, this hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, that's called the Shema, 
in Jewish culture, it means to hear. And then the love your neighbor as yourself in Hebrew is called the vayahavta. I have to re read it carefully. The vayahavta, which means you shall love. So these two phrases, the Shema and the Vayahavta, love God, love neighbor, these two phrases are sung all the time in Jewish worship and learning. They're constant refrains. And of course, they make up the foundation of the law. The scribe here in Mark even restates it. He says, yes, you're right, Rabbi Jesus. It's all about love, and Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. It really is all about love, isn't it? Jesus has been living out God's kingdom on earth, healing with love, teaching with love, feeding people and demonstrating what the truth of love is. And in the coming weeks, that love that God has for each of us would come to the ultimate test. As Jesus struggles and prays in the garden, is betrayed and denied by his friends, and then is crucified by the Roman government. In his final days, Jesus will demonstrate what Brett McCracken calls cross-shaped love or cruciform, cruciform meaning cross-shaped. It is this cruciform love that we are called to demonstrate to the world. Listen to what McCracken says. Cruciform love is welcoming the immigrant simply because they bear the image of God, even if the only thing they bring to us is hassle and possible harm. Cruciform love is praying for those who persecute us, whether it be ISIS terrorists or political foes. Cruciform love is serving and protecting our gay and lesbian neighbors, combating racism and hateful speech of all sorts, and advocating for the image of God dignity of every human being. It is embracing the homeless person despite the smell, healing the wounds of a soldier even if he is unjustly arresting us, and loving those we disagree with even if they don't love us back. Cruciform love, he writes, means clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, and ministering to the sick, the imprisoned, and the least of these. Cruciform love is the church financially supporting one another, even if it is costly. Love that is only convenient and conditional is not love. To love is to go out of your way, to be inconvenienced like the Good Samaritan, to sacrifice for the sake of another. Jesus had a lot of arguments with a lot of scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders about a lot of things, lots of little particular arguments and squabbles about little things. But when these two zoomed out and looked at the big picture, they found a place of agreement Love God, love neighbor. The scribe and Jesus were in agreement. They could take a step toward each other. And no one dared ask him any more questions because the entire atmosphere had changed. No amount of antagonism could stand up to these words. Love God, love each other. I wonder how far out we need to zoom before we can find some agreement and start moving back toward each other in our society. 
can we agree on this thing called love? And not sentimental love, but love as action. Can we agree on cruciform love? Can we agree on the intrinsic value of each person, not only in theory, but in our lived out lives? The person most at risk here, the widow, is the example of how we should live. But if we all took our responsibility to care for each other a little more seriously, would we be a little closer to the kingdom of heaven? Can we love like Jesus? Amen.